All right. Uh, давайте, у нас мы стараемся, uh, we, I'm going to continue in English because I think most of these folks will be speaking in English. Uh, we try to have a different crew each time, and as you can see, uh, the atheist in me survived. I am still not a believer, uh, but we've got a new crew of uh, folks that will be defending the truth. As you guys know, today the topic is the Bible. Uh, so before we go into the topic too much, I'm going to ask these folks again to introduce themselves, uh, starting with the best dressed man in town. Uh, let's give a big hand to Vasily. Uh, Thank you. Uh, then we've got Bogdan here as well. Hello, everyone. I'm excited uh, about Mark South coming back. I okay, good. A little uh, promotion there. Collect your five dollars at the door. <laughs> um, we've also got Oksana. Um, uh, she's uh, been very kind to join us today. Uh, all the girls, you can applaud. Uh, we've got Paul. I think everybody knows Paul. You have anything to say for yourself, Paul? <laughs> uh, yeah, and then we have our, our brother Artem, who was very kind to leave his family and kids uh, to join us. Or maybe just family. Um, but uh, he was very kind to join us, and we're very, very happy to have him, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you again, folks, for coming out. Um, I'm going to just start with a little introduction of the topic, uh, because some of you may have come up against questions around the Bible, and some of you may have not. And some of us take the book of the Bible for granted. So we say, hey, it's this book, I've believed in it uh, ever since I was a kid, and we think it is what it is. And that's a good place to be if that's where you're at, and you just take it with blind faith and you don't have any questions. But I know in, in my personal experience, as soon as I went to college, and it was the toughest semester of my life when I went and I took world religions, and then I also had a philosophy in the same semester, and my faith was tested. Because every time they would take the Bible and they would hold it up against every other religious book in the universe and they would say, well, the Bible is a historical book. There's some things we can take here. There's some things that are crazy we can't listen to. Uh, and just take it for the facts. And then take these books and they're all equal. And it's made so much sense when they said it. I mean, really, how do we know that the Bible is the truth? You know, why are we following this book and not another book? You know, heck, Scientologists wrote a book and they're following that and they seem to be living pretty good, right? Tom Cruise is rich and, you know, good looking and famous or maybe just famous and rich. Uh, but um, there's a lot, a lot of books out there that are called scripture. And how do we know that this book is correct? How do we know that it's not fallible? I used to have a supervisor back when I worked at a uh, uh, Chinese restaurant and uh, he was actually a white guy too. And, uh, and I would talk to him about scripture, and I would, you know, we, would, we would talk about the Bible, and he would always come back to me and say, I, I can't believe. He said, I read this book, I read Revelations, I read these other, you know, how can all this be true? You know, this is crazy. Like, why can you, I, I can't believe that you guys believe in this stuff. Uh, more so, there's a question, recently I was online, and it was just a forum uh, of atheists, actually, uh, and one guy writes, guess what? There is no archaeological evidence to support m most of the books, uh, most of the facts in the Bible. And he brought up a specific fact. And, uh, you know, it hits you. And if you don't dig in deeper, you, you're going to take that away. You're going to see that in the news. You're going to see that in other places. And you're going to say, well, maybe there is no evidence to back up uh, the, the, what's in the Bible. And yet when you go back and you study and you look at credible archaeological evidence and just geological and whatever, ev historical evidence, you find that there's just so much to support it that atheists don't want to admit. They're going to admit and they're going to believe what they want to believe and they're going to disregard what they don't want to. And so today's point is we're going to take this book, the holy book of the Bible, and we're going to talk about how this is the words of God. That this was written by the Spirit through men of God. And that's why we've got these amazing people here to talk us through all that. So, uh, again, one more time, let's give them a big hand. And I'm going to ask Vasily to go ahead and begin with his topic. Good evening. And um, I want to talk about a topic that uh, is rarely talked about, at least during services. And is the fact that the... Uh, Old Testament is very similar to other um, pagan writings. And um, I want to uh, answer the question of why is it so similar. So um, there's two answers to that part. And the first uh, example is, for instance, the flood. 
The flood is a very widely written um, about event that uh, pretty much you take any culture and they have some sort of writing that dates back really far and it tells about of a big flood that where everybody died except a single family. And it's, you find it everywhere from Asia all the way down to South America. So there's a couple of different interesting things about it. It's because all the versions are diff different. You know, the South American version has their own characters and their own way of describing it. And so is the, the Asian one. So where is the truth? And is it even a truth or is it just a big myth that everybody wrote about? Just the suggestion that pretty much every single culture, an ancient culture has um, an event so big written in their uh, history does suggest that a catastrophic event like that happened. And it's, uh, it's not a lie, it, it, it did happen because we do have so many different uh, aspects of it. Now the other question comes up is, well, which version is true? And to look at that, we have to look at the uh, origins of all of these writings. And if we start comparing them, you'd see that they're, they're different, but if you start comparing uh, regions that are more and more similar, you get them the first origin. So uh, if we talk about the South, uh, Southern American version uh, is very different than let's say the European version, but once we go to Middle Eastern, they become very similar. And the reason for that being is they had first account witnesses. Now, if we look at the Bible and we look at the Isaac, for instance, he lived in the same time uh, that the son of Noah, Shem, lived in. Um, in, in fact, he lived in the same region, so uh, he could go to the first, per, the first person account of this event and have a very descriptive, very correct uh, representations of it, and then pass it down to his uh, generation, which later on, uh, in the book of, um, when Moses was writing uh, the first books, he, he wrote, the, uh, wrote down the events. So, it's very accurate. Now, uh, Asia and, for instance, South Africa, South America, they didn't have that first person um, account. Yeah, so they, it was too far for them to go. So that's why it's, it's so different. Now, uh, there's many events like that, that are uh, events that happened, and then they got written down into other cultures because people were moving further away from the, where the event occurred. But if you trace it back, you see that it's pretty much in the general area of where the Bible was written. The other um, item is um, Psalm 20. So we, we get the events uh, being written in other uh, text, uh, writings of, of pagan religions, but what about um, non-events? For instance, Psalms, which was, was a um, more of a literature. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, archaeologists found uh, Egyptian uh, demotic um, scribes, I should say, and uh, demotic is a, it's a cursive kind of uh, of Egyptian writing, and they um, at first they were kind of puzzled that well, what was it, um, and once they started to find out more and more about these, and they saw that it was uh, a very close copy to Psalm 20. So the question comes, who was the first writer? Was it the Egyptians or was it the Bible? And we see that uh, as the scribes become, the scholars started studying it more, they see that the scribe who was writing uh, the Egyptian ones, he had very many errors, uh, scribal errors, and that it just indicates that the scribe, he did not know the language exactly, and he was translating it from somewhere else and so on and so forth. So you see that uh, plagiarism existed back then. It's not just in colleges. Uh, and people would grab stories that they would find, that they would like, and they would rewrite them and incorporate them into their own writings. And uh, that's what exactly what happened in the Egyptians because they actually had the name of God. They had Yahweh and Adonai in the text, but they added, they added uh, 
also the Egyptian gods. So those are just the two points that I want to say that is uh, the events that are seen in, in other pagan religions uh, can be traced back because they happened. And uh, if you're talking about non-event writings, they were plagiarized in a way, and, and you can find that out. And then uh, just the last point is um, most of them, most of the writings are incorporated with pagan gods, and all the gods uh, of pagan myths, they're, uh, they're doing very degenerative behavior, what we call immoral right now. So, and only God, only in the Bible, we have a God that is infinitely pure. He has no, no evil in him. So I'm, I'm going to follow up what you said with a couple of questions. Uh, the first thing you said, I mean, you're telling me that the flood is in all the cultures, and as long with some of the other stories. So you think that because it's in all of the cultures, it's true. Is that what you're saying? So uh, when, when you're looking at, at, at multiple um, writings of the same event, even sci scientists today, what they do is they would uh, find an event and then try to find writings about it in different parts of the world to prove that the event was true. For instance, volcanic eruptions would, would be written and very ancient as uh, the sun won't shine for a couple of days or very big trembling in different parts will describe it differently. Um, so yes, it's when you're talking about different parts of the world having the same writing, it pretty much means that it happened. I mean, I'll give you that, but uh, here's, here's the other question. When you, when you look at the Bible, if you're really honest, you know, and you're, you studied, because a lot of us, we kind of just skim it. If you really look at the Bible, you will find a lot of discrepancies. Uh, if you really study it and break it down, and you're going to go in, and you're going to find out that this, maybe even like in the creation story, sometimes you go in and, and, and people claim there are discrepancies there uh, in the New Testament. And they're going to say, well, in this chapter it says this happened, uh, but in this other book it, something else happened. You know, and let me give you another example, uh, and this is the one that I want you to answer directly. Uh, when you look at the numbers given in the Old Testament, and you're talking about how many, how many years the kings ruled, you know? Simple as that. You would think they would get it right. But yet, you know, the kings, uh, in, the, in the book of the kings in Samuel, it gives you one number. Then in Chronicles, it gives you another number. And little things like that, to me, would discredit the book of the Bible. So how would you as a Christian reply to that? So you have to look at the culture. Uh, when you're uh, talking about... And the reigns of the kings, when you had Israel as one nation, you have no problem. The three kings, they're all fine. But then once the nation divides into Israel and Judah, you have a problem where uh, Israel is in the north, and they have their own little culture, and then Judah is in the south. And they measure uh, the reign of the kings differently there, and how they measure it. So in the north, for instance, if you became king in December 31st, that would be your first uh, reign of your kingdom and then January 1st would be your second reign of your kingdom but in the south their culture was different and their the south is very different always brother yes and it's just funny <laughs> down there what they did is the first year that you became king isn't really your first year it's like your zero year it's the year that you're stepping into the kingdom so if you became king on January 1st on December 31st, you're not the first year of, of your kingdom. On January 1st of the following year, you're the first uh, year into your kingdom. So you can get that year discrepancy. The other thing is, and um, they ha did it a little bit in the south, but in the north, I should say, but mostly in the south and Judah, you would have these big periods of time where a king would go into war, and in order to protect himself, like an insurance policy for his uh, nation, he would um, pronounce his son, the prince, a king. So now you would have, uh, during certain periods of time, you'd have two kings at the same time. One would be the ruling king, and then the se second one would just be waiting for his dad to die. Uh, but, and he would count, the south would count that as... I'm a king already. Uh, yes, it's about 10 years before I became the ruling king, but on year 10 of me being a, a king, I be, uh, start reigning my, uh, my kingdom. So you have that discrepancy of how the cultures counted uh, 
the kingdoms. Okay, so you're, now you're talking about a cultural difference, but and there are a lot of cultural differences, and you can try to explain that away, uh, and that's fine. Um, what about actual errors in the text? Because that's, I mean, when you look at it, you can't explain that away with the cult. You know, these people like to misspell things a lot, you know? And these people like to write them down right. So you can't, you can't explain it away that way. And when you look at uh, something like the New Testament, you know? And it's, it's pretty, you know, it's, it is what it is. We know, we know what we've got in front of us, the books that are there. And yet you go back and you look at the text and the manuscripts that we have, and the multiple copies that we, we get all that from, and we have over 400,000 mistakes. You know, a letter off here, a letter off here, but it all adds up. You're talking about 400,000 mistakes. So how can you believe that something with 400,000 mistakes and something that we take so literally, how can that be true? Have you ever tried to read, write a book 400,000 times? And copy not just paste, you? brother, copy paste. <laughs> So back in the day, they, what they did is they rewrote it by hand, so it will actually take uh, sometimes up to a year, depending on which monk was doing it. The monks were doing that. So you have a couple of, of issues. For the, the first type of differences is um, uh, where you have small changes that pretty much do not m mean any, uh, any difference into the literal meaning of each sentence, and um, like uh, transposition, for instance, uh, where you reorder the, the, the words, or um, articles and pronouns, like in the English language, um, all the verbs are the same, you know, when I, just, I went, you went, she went. But when you're talking about uh, more like an Arabic or a uh, Greek language or Latin, for instance, you have different uh, genders to each um, to each uh, article and pronouns. So what you what you can do is, you can actually skip them, and uh, that's what they would uh, used to do. Is they would, you know, skip. Okay, he went. So they would just put went, and uh, and then other writers would write them in because they would think it'll have more meaning if they would say he went. So you have these small differences, but in general, they don't make any difference. Uh, and then there, are, and th those are pretty much account for about 99 percent of of all the mistakes, all the 400,000. The other 1% is the, they change the meaning a little bit, but they do not change the main teaching of that chapter of that book or the Bible as a whole. And why do these differences happen? Well, first of all, you have to understand when you're writing you know, day after day after day, the same writing, a person gets fatigued. So you would have uh, small mistakes because of that. Um, these were monks who would write into very old age, so you'd have old, uh, bad vision. So don't see very well, you know, you, you don't see a little apostrophe somewhere, and uh, you write down or you forget it, bad memory. Um, or bad lighting, you know, they, they would write very late into the night. And then the other thing is, um, in Latin, what you used to do is uh, you would have this continuous scripts where you would have no spaces between um, words, no word dividers, so you would just keep on writing and writing and writing. And it will be kind of hard to say, especially if you're translating and you know, translating into a more modern language where it will have space dividers and different punctuations to actually put them in. So every, every writer, every translator would, to the best of his abilities, through prayer, and um, they would write where they would presume would be the right apostrophe or the right period. But in general, that doesn't change the whole thing. Another issue was um, sometimes they would have good intentions and um, the people who would translate a Bible from especially one version to the next, what would happen is um, if you're translating a, or a single phrase from one uh, language to the next might not have the same meaning. And today, even um, I know when you're, they're translating Bibles to certain languages which, for instance, do not have bread at all, but their primary food intake is, for instance, fruit, they would replace where it has bread to fruit because for them, that's more understandable, their bread, because they never, they're never uh, ate bread. So, But so. let me interject. I, I mean, that kind of scares me, you know? So if, if it's not really bread in the original and we should be reading something else, like, I, I would want to know that. So what, where's the, what's the language then that we're getting our Bible from? Depending which version. 
So you have different translations, and I yeah. mean, nowadays with the more uh, newer versions, you're getting a more original text where they're finding better manuscripts that they're dating back uh, to being more original, and, uh, and they're comparing manuscripts to where they have less of these mistakes or where they came from, like the type of handwriting that was used. But are we so using the original language? Uh, I believe the, the, yeah. the, Okay, so, so we're using the original language, so we don't have that. But in the original language, uh, you know, you talked about 99% really don't mean anything, that's fine. But the 1%, how much does that really affect what we're getting today? So there, there's not, um, there's not pretty much, there's only a couple of texts that mm -hmm. theologists are debating about to this day, but the majority of it still doesn't change the whole aspect of the Bible as what we believe in as, as Christians. It's still the same thing that um, Lord is Lord, God is God, Jesus, and uh, God is the Trinity, Jesus, and, um, and the Father and the Holy Spirit, and the only way through eternal life is through Jesus Christ. It doesn't change that. Okay, so in the Bible today, what we read, uh, you know, in my ESV or, or whatever, uh, you, you would say the percentage of the mistakes is 9%, 10%, 5%. If I were to count, how much is a grain in an ocean? That's the percentage. So you're, it's you're very saying it's small. very minute? Yes. Okay. Do you guys have anything else to add to that? One, two, three. Is this on? All right, cool. Um, if you... The Jews, they have a very, very distinct way of writing things down. And for them, uh, they're not really translating to other cultures because their culture was very, very consistent. You're talking was, about the Old Testament now? Uh, in in Old Testament, okay. both, both. And their, their tradition is very, very consistent. And all through the years, if you read it in the original Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, you would see exactly what was written down because they didn't have to change it for the people because the people had the same exact religion all through the years, even Jews until today, which is very interesting because over, over the years, usually cultures change and their, their culture pretty much, much stays exactly the same. So they didn't, didn't have to change uh, the words such as, you know, bread to fruit. Mm -hmm. For other cultures you do, but if you look in the original, you can actually read in the original what it said. Do so. we have the original? Uh, we, have, we have we um, have we have Bible in, in Hebrew and Greek and uh, Aram Aramaic languages. Mm -hmm. We in don't the original have languages. Original languages. Okay. We don't have the original manuscripts because uh, they they wrote on like papyrus and stuff like that, and that would wear down over the years, so they had to rewrite it. We have copies of the originals, which are pretty much like the originals. Um, but and those copies we have compiled in the Bible. But if you want to look at the original ma manuscripts, most of them have deteriorated, deteriorated over the years. Okay. I'd like to add something. <clears throat> I like how you pointed out that, um, you know, different cultures. And so what I just, you know, thinking about it, saying, okay, so if you have a person from like Africa, like somewhere out there in their rural village, and he has the word of God, and then instead of you know, reading the bread of life, he reads the fruit of life, let's say. And for him, he understands that. For us, it's the bread of life. The thing is, the, the main point is that this, this word of God changes the life of that, has the potential, ability to change the life of that, you know, even the, the person in the rural village or us here. We have to understand this, that the languages that we speak even today are slang languages, right? Yo, how are you doing, buddy? I don't do that. Our no. grand, you don't do that? Well, our grandparents, or our, even if you ask the, the citizens, of, citizens of America, like the American-American people, not the immigrants, they wouldn't have used these, the words that we use today. So that's another thing. You know, as culture changes, our languages, uh, some languages die out and new, new languages are being, uh, you know, new, Evolve. you know? Okay, one, one. All right, let's give a big hand to Vasily then. And we're gonna ask Bogdan, please, to step up. Um, you can step up a little bit more than that. <laughs> Under the light. All right, everybody, hello. What I'd like to do today is show the relevance of the Bible and that it still has meaning and influence in our life today through prophecies. Primarily, there's going to be four examples, two from the past, two that's happening now or in the future. Now, before I do that, in Revelations, in the very beginning of it, it kind of gives you a promise. Um, I'll go ahead and read it, verse 3, chapter 1. 
Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. If I was able to predict something next week and it happens in that exact order, that'd be pretty impressive, right? And then I'd do that week after week after you do week. some pretty amazing things, Bogdan, I don't know. Well, nonetheless, the Bible does actually do that. And a few of these uh, examples we're gonna look at, if we can get the PowerPoint going, is primarily first about Jesus. There's over 300 different prophecies about his coming, his life, his death, his resurrection. And this is probably the most popular one because there's just so many uh, examples about him for Messiah. Um, for example, if we look at Micah 5.2, that's the original uh, many years prior to the event actually happening. And we see the Bible is actually kind of like a history book. And we're gonna hear more about uh, just different aspects of the Bible from our other speakers here. And this prophecies one, it's kinda you have to uh, think about in your mind like split, you know, if you're back then, and then you're in the future, and the differences that are going on. The uh, other example that I'd like to go through with is for the next slide, is about the temple. Um, it was built, it was destroyed, built again, destroyed, and then what's interesting about that is that in 165 BC, we hear this prophecy about the church, be, uh, the temple being destroyed, and it goes into details about kind of who destroys it and how they destroy it. And then 235 years later, we get the fulfillment of it. The uh, Roman soldiers under the command of Titus are actually are the ones that come in and desecrate pretty much the whole city, including the temple. If we can get the next slide, we'll get some images. And so what we hear is that in Matthew 24, there was actually this the sentence by Jesus, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. We see these stones here. These are actually uh, courtesy of Google, and that's pretty much all that is remaining of that temple right now. So, 70 AD, this is uh, around 40 years after Christ's death. Thank you. That's pretty cool. I mean, if we think about it, there's actually a lot more prophecies in the Bible you know, if there was a prophecy in there for me, like Bogdan, you know, this and this and this, I would be, you know, willing, or I would really be interested in that to find out what it's talking about and what I should do. And that's where we find ourselves today. If we keep going with the next slide, um, well, the prophecy about the future. So, global communication. In Revelations, it's talking about how every eye will see and hear if you were in that back uh, past uh, framework in your mind, it's not possible to communicate thousands of miles away with someone because you had to go on a horse or across the sea with a ship and stuff like that. Today, through the advent of technology, through the prolification of news and mass media, that's actually now possible. So we can actually see how in the present time, some of these uh, prophecies are actually coming you know, to fruition, they're actually happening all around us. And financial control over the world. My mom was just talking to me about this today in the kitchen, how her grandma and her would be talking about this and they just could not imagine, you know, what that could be like. What's the possibility of that even happening? How can you have that control? Less than 50 years later, here we are today, and we actually know how that can happen. You know, through the RFID chips, you were saying, you know, that's actually now a possibility. So I guess, you know, the Bible is relevant from, you know, thousands of years ago to today, because what it says is gonna happen actually happens. And that's all fair and well, but here's, here's there, there are things there that I don't think are gonna happen. And here's, you know, going back to, uh, you know, I was talking about my former boss from the Chinese place, right? And he goes in and he says, there's one reason I can't believe the Bible, and it's because of revelations. And when you open it up, 
and you read about the four beasts with a head of, you know, a, an eagle, and then their eyes all over, and they've got wings, that's fantasy. You know what I mean? Like you read that in, in fiction book. It, yeah, it's, it's scary if it was true, you know, but how can that be true? You see what I mean? Uh, sure. And when you go back and you read some of these other things, uh, you know, I, I mean, I can imagine a city made of gold. That, that could possibly be true. But just like the wheels that keep turning or the multi-headed beasts that are there uh, and stuff that we read in Daniel, that stuff belongs, you know, seemingly in a fiction book. I don't know how... And, and you can tell me, how can I believe a book that seems like it was written by a fiction writer? Sure. And with genetically modified stuff, you know, we have two-headed dogs and cats soon well, already true, happening. Bro. Let's, uh... <laughs> um, I can totally understand where someone's coming from like that. I'm sure that parts of what it speaks about in Revelation is perhaps in the spiritual realm, you know, I'm not going to say that I know, you know, that this is exactly literal. Um, so we have to take parts of it definitely in faith. We also know that we have a God and, a, and Jesus who already has a good track record of promising things of happening and, them, and actually, you know, them coming through. So we definitely have that track record of, hey, what I say does happen. So I would say that if someone, you know, isn't a believer who isn't saved, they may still read some of that stuff, and unless the Holy Spirit, you know, moves in them, their eyes will open up, and they will actually see it as something that might be scary or whatnot in the future, but they, they would believe it on faith. And who are you to say uh, that fantasies, are like those animals are fantasies? Because if we look at dinosaurs, for example, they, we have very weird dinosaurs. Uh, very many cultures talk about dragons. Uh, that probably never even crossed each other. If you look at the Chinese calendar, uh, one of the animals is a fantasy animal called a dragon, right? Um, so if we look at these things, that these might have been animals that actually existed back in the day. I'm not saying the four-headed, but there are some weird animals that we are still discovering to this day. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is the idols that the nations had, the pagan nations, I was very surprised. They have an idol of a calf. They have an idol of you know, some weird creatures. And who knows, maybe those were demons or some kind of angels that came down because that was describing the angels, the, how the mm -hmm. angels look. And I can understand there might be some weird things in the spiritual world that we can't see, you know? So I can, I mean, we don't control that. It's not physical, you know? So there might be some weird things out there. How do we draw that line, you know? How do we know then what is like the spiritual animal and what is a real legit thing that we're going to experience? For someone who's coming from an unregenerated heart, it is all science fiction, mm -hmm. you know, because that's the only thing they can relate it to. It would be extremely difficult, I think, for someone to try to, you know, understand it as fact and, and truth, you know, without the Holy Spirit in their life. The other uh, thing that I want to point out is a lot of the prophecies that we see, especially in the Old Testament, um, that were fulfilled, were given out uh, in, not in literal terms, but uh, in these Ooh. Um, for instance, uh, Joseph, he saw a dream um, or he was mm -hmm. describing a prophecy that was given to a king where he saw a dream with cows. Now, That's pretty crazy, like the cows eating the cows? Exactly, but so. once you look at the reality of how he described what it really would be like of the seven years of prosperity and the seven years of, uh, of no, uh, no, uh, no harvest, uh, you start understanding that a lot of these are in real terms, but they're, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Eric Goldberg, thank you. Yeah. Excuse me. So it's, it's, um, it's not all just literal animals and uh, statues, and some of them would be, but uh, others might be uh, things that to this day we're still trying to uh, understand. I got another thing to add. <clears throat> The resurrection, resurrection of the saints, we will be given new bodies. And so when we will receive the new bodies, we will see what it is actually that John saw, you know? And so if any one of us would have received that, that revelation, none of us would have uh, explained it in accurate detail. You know what I mean? So, so John himself tried to exp express uh, in writing what he saw. And so I'm sure what he saw in, in there in heaven 
or what was happening there, the animals, right, the, the, the golden city, to us, it's kind of a surprise because we just, just because of us living in a sinful body, uh, having a physical realm of, around us. You're trying to, you're trying to put um, a supernatural world into our physical realm. You know? Are you saying maybe the language barrier, there was a language limitation or? Just our, our, our physical body is a limitation of what the uh, spiritual, natural. Uh, super, what yeah. is spiritual. What is spiritual, yeah. So for instance, uh, another thing is, sorry to you, uh, if you had seen a helicopter 4, 000, or 400 BC, how would you describe it? Uh, Metal maybe, turkey, <laughs> like a big dragonfly. Maybe? Exactly, okay. and that's what we see in Revelations. Actually, is description of helicopters and tanks and so a on dragon, and so forth. Yeah. So they would use to the best of their abilities to describe it. But again, how would you describe something that you don't know how it's called and what it's made of and how it works? Yeah, I think they just used what they had around them. You know, their own language, their experience, and their culture. What they could relate, possibly. Okay. All right. Let's give Bogdan a big hand, and let's. Uh, and let's move on to the lady in the house, Oksana Shako. Hi, everyone. Um, today I'm going to be speaking about manuscripts. So um, just for those that don't really maybe understand, so we don't have the actual original Bible, okay? And I know that kind of can freak you out, but there's actually other classical literature out there that um, we trust, that um, we read in our... Um, high schools and our history books, and we actually trust them a lot more than the Bible, uh, when in reality the Bible has so much more, so many more manuscripts. Um, okay, so 24,000 handwritten copies of the New Testament, that's the New Testament alone, um, and the oldest fragment is dated within decades of the original. Um, and actually, if you can do the next slide. I'm just going to show you, um, compare again. Um, we have the New Testament. We have Homer, uh, so Homer's writings, Plato's writings, and Caesar's writings. Um, you guys probably know about the Gallic Wars from Caesar. Yeah, I think many of us want to know wh who Homer is because <laughs> he's not Homer Okay, uh, most of these are uh, philosophers, okay? So is they... that the inventor of the salad there, Caesar? <laughs> Okay, um, no, that's not the salad, Caesar. Okay, so, okay, let me go back. Uh, most of these are philosophers. Philosophers are people that um, want to gain wisdom. Philosophy means the love of wisdom, okay? So most of them would try to figure out what is reality? Um, what, what am I? Who am I? Just the basic questions of life, really. And I personally believe that philosophers are trying to figure out um, who really they are. What are they here on earth for? So, now that we know who they are. Um, so, I'm just going to go back. So, Homer, um, he's really famous for his writing called the Iliac. Um, later, on, I don't know what he's famous for, but he's pretty famous. Um, and Caesar, he's... Um, he had a great recipe for a salad. <laughs> I think that's what we're talking about. He's famous for his Gallic Wars. And actually, he was um, a general, and he wrote about um, a war they had in Troy, which is now in Turkey. So he wrote about it, and today we read it in our history books, and um, we rely on his writings. So we believe everything that he says, how this happened, how many, it's 10 years he was out of country, and what happened. So I just want, I want to throw in some history in there. So for the New Testament, um, we have, let's see, 5,686 manuscripts. Manuscripts, again, are copies of the original uh, why are they copies? Because a long time ago they wrote on um, papyrus, which is a plant, and uh, I think they roll it out or something. I don't know. I didn't do research on that, but um, it's a plant, and they would write on the plant. And of course, if you guys can think of like writing on a leaf, it's gonna deteriorate in a couple years, right? So they had to rewrite it, and um, they didn't only write it for the New Testament. They did it for Homer's works, Plato's, and Caesar's. Aristotle's works, who you name it. So if they wanted their writings to be preserved, they had to rewrite them. And then later on, they had the animal skins that they wrote on and so on and so forth. And now we have paper. So anyways, um, so the New Testament, they iPads. have... They had <laughs> And iPads, true. Um, they had 5,686 manuscripts for the New Testament alone that we found. 
Um, Homer, we find 643 only. Plato, we only found seven manuscripts. For Caesar, we only found 10. So if you guys can see, the New Testament has a lot of manuscripts. And for some reason, um, we rely on these classical literature authors a lot more than the New Testament or the Bible. And if you guys can click the next slide for me. So the next slide. Okay, so now that we've found these manuscripts, how do we know, um, maybe they found them so many years later, you know, um, what's the time gap between when they were actually written and the copy of it? How, how much later did the copy exist um, from these writings? So the New Testament actually, um, it was written, I think the New Testament was written about, finished um, in 95 A.D., and um, I believe, uh, da, 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 da. they found, I think, sorry. Um, I'm not good at math either, <laughs> so. Okay, they found, the, the new one that they found, the, the recent one that they found, um, um, according to scholars, was from 120 AD. So only 25 years time span different, and that's for the whole New Testament. I mean, sorry, not the New Testament. That's for a fragment of the New Testament. Um, for the whole New Testament alone, uh, the newest one that they found was 300 years after it was written, which is after 95. Um, for Homer, um, his writings from the original were 500 years. So they found copies um, 500 years later. That's the recent one. Uh, for Plato's writings, um, 1,300 years later. For Caesar, 900 years. And Aristotle, 905. So if you guys can see, figuratively, if you guys are going to think about this, okay, let's say I believe in Caesar's writings for his Gallic Wars, and um, when I find out that the copy from the original is 900 years later, how do I know what was written before then? Maybe something was added, maybe something was, you know, taken out. Um, when we have the New Testament, people always, um, you know, throw this question, like, how do I know if anything is added to the New Testament? Well, for your information, um, it's the most recent copy that we have, according to all these, the rest of the classical um, novels out there. So, um, so, but how do we know how accurate is our New Testament or the Bible, right? Um, and Vasily actually mentioned this before um, today. Um, we have 400,000 copies of the whole Bible, and this includes fragments, so it's not like you find a papyrus and it's the whole book of um, Deuteronomy or something. Um, sometimes they're just fragments. And actually, if you can click the next slide, I'll go back to this one. Um, there's a, a papyrus fragment. It's called P52, and the P stands for papyrus. Um, this is the Gospel of John. This is the one, the most recent one that they found, actually. Um, the one that's dated 25 years after the New Testament was written. So you're saying that our Bible, the ones that we have today, are, are copies of, uh, of what's written on these uh, fragments of paper. Yeah, exactly. Translated from these. By the way, um, for, th for people that ask you and say, well, how do I know, you know, that there's, let's say, the Russian translation of the Bible and we have the American translation from the Russian, how do I know they didn't add anything? Um, they do not translate the Bible from Russian or anything. They translate the Bibles from the original um, languages, just for you guys to know that. But anyways, um, and here we have, uh, this is a fragment from John 18, I believe, uh, verse 31 through 35, and then the back side has two, two more verses. Um, and then if you can do the next slide, there's an, another slide, um, uh, maybe not, about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947, and most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were of the Old Testament. Uh, is that the ones on the bottom there, maybe? Uh, yes, sorry, thanks. <laughs> um, so they were found um, in 1947, and it was most of the Old Testament, except the book of um, Esther. And um, they also included a couple books from the New Testament. Um, but up until this time, actually, um, people have, have doubted because the Old Testament, the most recent one that they found was from 1000 AD. And um, people doubted. They said, well, I don't know where, where the rest of them are. 
there were a couple, but they're saying that this is not as recent as we thought. Um, but then the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, some shepherds found, found them, and they were dated to 100 BC. So um, that's a good number. Basically, they were even older than what we had um, prior to these. So I'm going to go back to um, uh, how accurate are these copies, right? We want to know, since we have these copies, how accurate are they? Are we able to rely on them? So Vasily mentioned... Um, that most of the uh, errors are spelling and grammar. I'm just going to give you guys examples. I actually looked some up. And um, for example, on one manuscript, they would say like the, the word cup. And in another one, it would say the cup. You guys still know it's a cup, right? It's not like it's the hair or something. Um, or it would say <laughs> the 12 or the 12 disciples created versus made age versus of the age thrown out versus having been cast out. She will bear versus Mary will bear. And then um, different uh, Greek words for the word work. So these are just some examples. And as you guys can imagine, this isn't going to um, change the whole meaning of the scripture, right? It's just a word that maybe somebody added some, and Vasily talked about this. So um, I think that would be it. Can I jump in here real quick? Yes. All right, so you're talking about the accuracy of the scrolls and, you know, being found like 25 years later and whatnot. How do you know who wrote that, though? You see what I mean? Where, okay, we might, we might take the Bible and it says, yeah, I was, it was written by John or whoever, but how do I know that that's to John the disciple, you know, and not John his cousin or, you know, somebody else that came in and just wrote some of these books and passed them off as the, as the word of God. And the now, copies, you mean yeah, that? well, copies or just, if they're fake, you know, somebody okay. else wrote them. You know, maybe an epistle or something, you know. They signed Paul's name to it, and then, you know, mm -hmm. everyone thinks it's by Paul. Okay. John, John, particularly, um, that one he mentions a few times. Um, he says the disciple whom Jesus loves or the one who um, was at the bosom of Jesus, like at the Last Supper. And the way he writes it, he implies that it's him. So that there are certain things we can, we can see. Um, Paul, he says, I, Paul by the will of God, the apostle of Jesus Christ. So he introduces who he is. But we, you know, do we know that it's really Paul? Like, how can we know that it's Paul Paul? Well, how do we know that it was Homer or Plato? I mean, Homer, everybody knows. But, I, I mean, he, valid point. Paul yeah. usually left his signature at the end of, by, by history, we know that he left a signature at the end of the manuscripts and uh, epistles. And some of the epistles weren't actually written by Paul. And he says at the end, this was written by so-and-so and signed by Paul. So we know by, by the signatures it was. Okay. I will answer this question, but can I just go back for a second? Um, you can grab a seat. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to mention, I forgot this. This is so important. I thought this was pretty cool. So um, the Iliad, this is writing from Homer. <laughs> um, sorry, I just have to do this. This is really cool. So they found um, the manuscripts from Homer, right? And they discovered that the manuscripts that they had, the, the 400 that they had, um, they discovered that out of 15,600 manuscripts, or lines, sorry, over 400 lines were in doubt. So they didn't match 400 lines out of um, 15,000, okay? The New Testament, 40 lines, only 40 lines out of 20,000 lines. So again, um, if you are going to go back to Homer, I'm sorry, the New Testament one's about that one. But, um, and then a lot of people ask, uh, how do we know that the Bible was rewritten by, you know, who, if it wasn't, if anything was added to it by the monks, um, or the, the human scribes, or what, what happened? Um, how do we know that it's the same Bible that was, you know, the, from the original, um, it's not a fairy tale, um, and I just wanted, if you guys are going to learn anything today, I want you to know that the Bible is a reliable collection of historical events. That's what I got, want you to remember from me. Um, so think about it. Out of 66 books um, written in three languages, uh, written in three different continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, written by 40 authors, all of them uh, were completely different. Um, they, were, they were raised in different cultures. Um, some of them were doctors, some of them were fishermen. 
So they're all different, yet out of these 66 books, we see that there is one topic, and that is Jesus Christ. And I just wanted to throw that back to you guys. But anyways, coming back to the monks, let's say that they gather the 500, 5,686 um, manuscripts from the New Testament. I'm only talking about the New Testament right now. Let's say they, okay, I'm going to round it to 6,000. Let's say they um, get the 6,000 um, manuscripts and they want to change them, okay? So what do they have to do? They have to steal them, okay? So they have to find them. They steal them. Um, they tell the exact same line, all of them. They don't show their work. They don't show their ink work. And they put them back to where they belong. And this is going to take them about 100 years to do, right? 6,000 manuscripts. You're talking but, about making stuff up and read, yeah, redoing Yeah, adding everything. to the Bible. How do we know that it's actually the right people that wrote it and why, why would they do this, right? Um, but in the 20, uh, second and third century, they have the Greek New Testament translated into Latin, Coptic, and Syriac. So now they have to do all of the above. They have to go find the three other translations, steal those, um, bring them back in wherever they're going to rewrite something, make up this lie, um, put him back. Do you want to say something? I mean, it sounds like a long process. So you're saying it's pretty yes. much impossible with everything that's going on. It's really impossible. And apart from that, there are commentaries that the early church fathers wrote of the Bible, New Testament. And if you're, and sometimes they included verses from the Bible. And they say that if you were to just collect the verses from the Bible, you could make up 95 to 98% of the New Testament alone without any manuscripts. Of people that were quoting the original. Of people original. that were quoting the original Bible. So what I'm saying is, really, it's impossible. It will take 300 to 400 years alone just to take all these documents, to take them in, to translate them, to set a lie into them, and put them back to where they were without anyone knowing. Um, I think that's it for me. All right, thank you very much. Let's give her a big hand. And we're going to ask Paul to step up to the mic. We'll go ahead and uh, step out a little bit further than they did, I think. One, two, three. Wake up, everybody. <laughs> um, what I love about the Bible is uh, when I went to college, I, all my beliefs were also challenged. But I learned that any subject, no matter what you take, if you take the age of the earth, if you take science, if you take historical documents, if you take archaeology, if you dig deep enough, it all leads down to the Bible, and it's like when you're digging, and then first you're like, people told me there's gold over here, it's only clay, but then once you hit, hit the gold, you're like, finally, I got it. So any, any subject you take is very interesting. I imagine, I know nobody likes genealogies. Who reads genealogies in the Bible? Like all the way through, no, nobody? All right, I sometimes skip it too, but I've read all of them in my time, just, just so I could say that I did. Uh, imagine you're just different, today, brother, you're just different. Imagine if today, someone here, like Dima, Dima Rebin, right? So if we took him and we traced him back all the way to Moses, generation to generation, and, or to Abraham and say, here's Abraham, or back to Noah and say, here's Noah, and Noah had this son, this son, this son, and we go all the way to Dima. Wouldn't that be awesome? With death dates and birth dates? Wouldn't that like prove the Bible and be like, that's awesome, right? This is exactly what the Jews did. We came from pagan Relig uh, from pagan people, pagan religions. We're supposed to be all dead, killed, wiped out. But by the grace of God, by Jesus Christ, we are ac accepted into his family. Uh, is there any, are there any Jews here who have Jew lineages? So there, there are some people. So you can probably, most likely not, but if you were a Jew and you actually lived in Jerusalem, you can most likely trace back down the line and see where you came from. Who, how many generations you are far away from Moses, which is really cool. Uh, Jews, they have an account, a very, very close, descriptive uh, account of every single generation. They keep everything in track. They give credit where, where credit is due. If you go to any PhD professor on the planet who is um, majoring in Jewish studies, and you ask him, who brought down... Uh, who brought down Torah from the mountain? He's going to say Moses. Everybody knows it's Moses. Or you ask him, who brought the Israelites into the promised land? He's going to say Joshua. Everybody knows it's Joshua. It's simple stuff. Who, then you, you start going deeper. You say, who uh, brought people back from Babylonian exile and started the second temple period? It's Ezra. Who uh, put together the Mishnah? 
And I think that was, what were the names? There, there was two people who did, uh, wait up, Mishnah. Judah the Prince put together the Mishnah. He codified the Mishnah. his name was etc. but. Yeah. <laughs> Judah the Prince codified the Mishnah. And you say, okay, who put together the Gemara? And that was, I wrote this one down. Ravina and Ravashi. So they keep a very, very strict account of all the people who actually did all these things. And that's what's awesome. We know that the most important person pretty much in Jewish history was Moses, right? Moses brought down the Torah. It basically started the religion. And um, Lawrence, Lawrence Kelman. Lawrence Kelman ran an experiment. He's a Jewish rabbi, and he ran an experiment just to find out because he was born in a Jewish family, and he started doubting his religion big time. So he went to Jerusalem, flew over there, and found a rabbi and said, Rabbi, he asked him all this Jew stuff about Judaism, and he said, hey, can you tell me how do you know all this stuff? And he said, well, my rabbi told me that. And he said, okay, who's your rabbi? And he told him it was Yeruchim, Rabbi Yeruchim Lubavitz. And so he looked up the documents. He found books, several books stating that there was a relationship between Rabbi Yeruchim Lubavitz and this dude that he was talking to, right? So that, he said, okay, probably there was a relationship there. Then he went deeper and he's like, okay, who was the rabbi of Rabbi Yeruchim Lubavitz? So he did research again. He found several documents that said, the relationship between Yeruchim, uh, Yeruchim Lubavitch's mentor was Rabbi Simkel Zissel Zayf. Ladies, take note, these are good baby names. <laughs> <laughs> and Simkel Zissel Zayf was the next one. And he played the game, he went to the next one. The next one was, um, he found Yisrael Salanter, Rabbi of Simkel Zissel Zayf. And here, he, he played the game all the way over, finding manuscripts, and he came up with this table right here. Can I see the slide? This is the table with death dates and birth dates of people going from Rabbi Yeruchim Lubavitz all the way to Moses right there in the top left corner. All right? And we can see every single, every single date over there on that list. And you can produce thousands of these documents if you go to Jerusalem. You find a person, and they keep account of every single year because they see themselves as the nation of God, and they have to keep account of all these things before their holy God which is really awesome, but we pagans, all they wanted to do was drink, you know, and have fun in life and just die. They don't do anything. Um, but I'm glad we are now saved by Jesus Christ. And this is our lineage, lineage through Jesus Christ that we are made sons of Abraham. And another thing, if there was a gap, if there was a gap of 2,000 years somewhere and we lost the Torah, we, we just lost it. There was a huge disaster. The Torah was lost. And some guy named Fred comes out and says, hey, here's the Torah. God said this. But during this disaster, everything was lost. This is some majority of the religions are started. Muhammad came and said, hey, you guys are doing this all wrong. I just spoke to God. God told me this is how it's supposed to be done. Right? And we can't check that. We, we, we just have to believe him. He just woke up from epilepsy and said it was a prophecy from God. And we can take different religions like that. And that's, that's really how one of his prophecies happened. He was just, <laughs> it seemed like epilepsy. Um, so... We take any of these religions like that and trace it back, and almost all of them have a huge gap. Uh, one of the Hindu religions, he also said, um, this guy, he spoke with him. Sorry, I'm going on rabbit trails. This is just interesting stuff. So in one of the Hinduism religions, there is an event where um, God spoke to their people. Also, God spoke directly to three million people. And so this guy's like, whoa, what are you talking about? We have the same thing here when we're uh, at the Mount of Sinai. God also spoke to all the people by the Mount of Sinai. And he said, so what happened then after he spoke? Well, he said, well, all the people dropped dead. He's like, okay, and how do you know that, you know, this happened, that God spoke to all these people if they all dropped dead? He said, oh, well, a thousand years later, a guy came. <laughs> and basically, basically right there, you know it's a lie. And there's a verse in the Bible where God says, who, what nation has heard God speak and still lived? That's in Deuteronomy. And that is my concluding statement for this. Okay, well, and I'm gonna be quick. Yeah, good job, by the way, that was incredible. Um, I'm gonna, in, in, in because of the time, I'm gonna ask you just one question, you know, and you talked about God speaking from the mountain, and there are a lot of miracles and a lot of things here that are kind of crazy in the Bible, you know? Uh, and I'm not gonna list them all, but going back to what you said, you know, there's a sound on a mountain and three million people hear it. That's pretty unbelievable. So how would you explain that? 
Um, that's actually very interesting. Most religions start with one person. A person comes around and says, hey, this is how you're supposed to believe. Everybody believes him, right? Buddha, you, you hear all these names, Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus. Um, almost always it's one person. Here, Jews, they believe three million people started the religion. What kind of lie can you say to three million people to make them all believe God spoke to them? There are three things you can do. You can do past lie, present lie, or future lie. You can come to them and say, your ancestors heard God speak, right? But then they can go back and ask their ancestors, like their grandparents, and say, did God tell, sp speak to us? And they're going to say, no, I never heard about that. That's a new one. <laughs> and you, you can check that. And uh, then you're going to ask, well, why in the world aren't they telling me that? Why is some random guy telling me this? And they can ask. There's no confirmation. It's lost. Another thing is, if, if it was present lie, uh, for example, Moses stood there and said, you, people all here, you just heard God speak. And this is what God said. God said this and that and gives you 618 laws to follow. One of them is like being circumcised and you're going to be like, oh, wait, no, I did not hear, hear God speak. I don't want to believe you on this one. And he gives you 618 laws to follow and out of nowhere, 3 million people just start following them. No, they must have heard God speak in order to be like, okay, fine, we'll follow these laws. Like, what kind of lie can you do this? Or was it a national drug trip? Uh, if it was, then, I mean, three million people all came up with the same vision. We would have that repeating. Signs can be repeated. Uh, these things repeated. And we had a bunch of drug trips over the years, and not one of them came up with a new religion. <laughs> so there, there are things like that that we can tell, say that it's supernatural, and only God could have done it. And the future one, you could say, your ancestors will hear, I mean, <laughs> your children will hear God speak. And then you will tell that to your children. Your children will hear God speak. And that, that's not going to work because up to today, it would come and they're going to say, we never heard God speak. And we don't have that line. So the only thing we conclude is that it was supernatural. It was 3 million people all agreed on the same thing and agreed to, fo agreed to 619 laws that they had to fo uh, follow for men, which is insane. Okay, I think that's pretty strong. Let's give them a big hand. That is incredible. Thanks again for that uh, chart. And finally, Artem Shako, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, due to the lack of time, I want to go really quick. Guys, get ready to uh, flip those slides, okay? Okay, I was sitting here and trying to recap everything, trying to add my two points. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to do is just recap everything what uh, everyone here said. By the way, awesome job, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, so uh, why is the Bible true versus the other books? True or false? PowerPoint up? Okay, well, the guys are trying to, uh, there you go. Thank you. Okay, so we all have uh, our Bibles, right? We bring them into church. We have them at, at our you know, homes. We read them, hopefully more often. Um, and uh, my question is, what do all the religious books have in common? Well, if you look at uh, all the religious books, we have uh, books that promise us peace and a better life. The Bible does also that, right? The righteous man will live. Um, with a blessed life, and uh, so my question is, what is unique about the Bible? We've already seen this. The only book that we have on earth here is the Bible that has future events uh, that are predicted with verifiable accuracy, okay? And so this means, what does this mean? You know, man alone cannot do this kind of stuff where they predict, you know, the flood or uh, they say, you know, the revelation end times will come, you know, or they say Jesus will be born. Man alone cannot do that. And this means that the author itself must be God, God who is all-knowing, omni uh, you know, omnipotent, om omnipresent, and omniscient. And this means that the books themselves that we have, the book of the Bible, all of them must be inspired, inspired by God, meaning man cannot alone and make something up. Really quick, some of the prophecies. Prophet Daniel uh, said that the Messiah would begin, begin his ministry 483 years after the issuance of a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay? That's pretty exact. Uh, and so the declaration, the Persia king, uh, Artax, Artax, I don't know how to pronounce that, but anyways, it has my name in there. To the Hebrew priest said in 458 BC, and 483 years later, Jesus begins this ministry. That's one. Pretty awesome. Uh, prophecies continued. Around 700 BC, prophet Micah, we already uh, heard that, right? Named the city Bethlehem to be the birthplace of, uh, of uh, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. 
What do we do? We celebrate the birth of Jesus who was born in Bethlehem. Awesome, right? Really quick, prophecies or the probability of at least eight uh, prophecies happening during Jesus' time, lifetime. You guys see that Texas right there? Okay. Do you know, you know what Texans believe that they have their own country, right? They look at U.S. and they say, that's all Canada. It's a special place, brother. Yeah, they all say, that's all Canada. Texas is, you know, U.S. themselves. So, really quick, the probability of eight of of the prophecies happening during Jesus' time is this. You take a bunch of Oreo cookies, right? Who loves Oreo cookies? I like where you're going with this. Okay. (laughs) But do we have our cafe open at the end? Uh, It will be indeed. They will not be serving Oreos, but... (laughs) Okay. All right, so you take a bunch of Oreo cookies, right? Black, um, black cookies, right? You fill it up with, uh, you know, you fill it state of Texas two feet high, all right? Uh, now I really like where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, two feet high, and then you have Pete come out there, right? Blindfolded, and I have a white cookie. What's a good white cookie? I don't know. A white cookie is sugar cookies. Are sugar awesome. cookies, right? Yes. I have a white cookie, and I place it somewhere in the state of Texas, all right? And so we have Pete coming out, and she's roaming around, circles back and forth, and I say, okay, Pete, you have only one chance to pick up a cookie. He picks it up. What's the probability of him picking up the white cookie? See, this you is see? how obesity in America starts, right here. <laughs> you see? You see how impossible, right? Uh, so the probability of eighth prophecies happening during Jesus' time, but we see, we heard that 300 of them happened during Jesus' time. So next slide. That's awesome, guys. How, how did our list of 66 books come to be? Okay, our 66 books are in the canon because they are acknowledged as authoritative. Now, we cannot just make up uh, or uh, have a, you know, like Oksana said that we, we found a book and we said, okay, this is authoritative. You know, uh, uh, the Abidinyenya, right? You, we can't just say, this is authoritative, we're going to include it in the Bible. No, that is not how it works. What's the canon? Explain the that. The canon right? is basically a closed collection of books. It's closed. It's not it's open. A series of books. A series of books. Finished. Correct. Okay. Correct. And again, they did not become authoritative after being included in the canon. Okay, so there was not a bunch of guys that said, okay, we'll take uh, 66 books. And oh, by the way, they're, we're just going to make them authoritative. It's God-inspired. No. These were the actual books that were authoritative before the canon. And so no church council can make a book, uh, a Bible authoritative. You know what I mean? It was already authoritative. Next slide. The awesome thing about the Bible is that the detailed records, uh, I think Paul mentioned it, right? And Brother Vasily here mentioned that the Bible has family lines, all those genealogy lines. I skip them personally, you know, but I really do appreciate the fact that our Bible has these genealogies. Why? Because we see you know, how the, the genealogy of how the line of David and then Christ, we see lands of occupation, we see lifespans, we see, we see events. So if anyone is trying to make up a, a book, would they really go into such great detail? Question yourself. Okay. Next slide. Old Testament. How did the Old Testament came about to be? Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament writings were verified by the apostles themselves in Jesus Christ. When we read, we read the New Testament, we read that, you know, Jesus mentioned, it is written, or the apostles, you know, they say, scripture, uh, scripture cannot be broken. Meaning that before the uh, New Testament, the canon, right, the co- collection of books, was for the Old Testament was closed. In uh, Luke 24, 44, Jesus speaks of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. See, so you, were, you could already see that there is a collection there, okay, before uh, the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament, uh, uh, next slide, uh, uh, there you go, Canon 2. Uh, there was a, a Jewish historian, Jophes, uh, Josephus, yeah. And he mentions, he speaks of the 22 Old Testament books. He does not list them by name, but he says, hey, there's five, uh, uh, according to our records, he was a historian, trying, again, historians, they look at the past, right? And he says, okay, historically speaking, there were five books of Moses, 13 books of the prophets, four books of the hymns. We get our, our uh, Old Testament uh, 22 books as we accept them as divine, and so do, do the Jews. There was a council, of, uh, it's called the Jamnia, Jamnia Council, uh, at the end of the first century, Jewish council. Uh, the Jewish uh, theologians met there and they said, okay, we'll discuss adding, the, uh, you know, adding Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon into the uh, collection of books. Next slide. 
So the Jews have accepted the 22 books. How many books do we have in the Old, uh, Old Testament? 39. Correct. The 22 books is actually our 39. So when the, Jew, when the Jews have, uh, for instance, the first and second kings, they have it all in one. You see what I mean? So it's actually the same. It's actually the same content. We just have 39, they have 22. And they have accepted that as divine, divine since before Christ, meaning that before Christ's ministry, the Jews uh, had this canon. There were other writings again, but they were never made it, made it into the canon because again, they were not considered inspired. And that's not authoritative. So this is really important to have a canon, a closed canon of these 39 books where none, no other writing would be added. Why? Because people would make stuff, stuff up. All right, New Testament. Within uh, 50 to 75 years, you have New Testament books, right? They're being read in Corinth, the Corinth, the Roman church, right? The Thessalonica church, right? And so, so let's say Pete is the pastor of a uh, uh, Roman church, okay? So he's reading the New Testament writings, and let's say Brother Paul is the pastor of uh, Thessalonica. And so he has the two books of, uh, let's say, um, Mark and John, right? And Pete has two books of Luke and Matthew. And so one church might not have the letter, let's say, of, like I wrote here, of Titus or the Gospel of John. And thus that, you know, those that did not have the copies would, you know, not be too quick to automatically accept them. You know what I mean? As authoritative. So you're saying have, if, if Paul came to me and said, hey, I've got this book that yeah. was written by Mark, I'm not going to believe him right away without yeah. going through it. Correct, correct. And that's totally understandable, right? Because they didn't have Wi-Fi. They didn't have uh, internet access, right? So you would have one church, you know, ha having these authoritative books and someone else would have these. Um, so f regarding the New Testament, we don't know the f when the first collections were made. The New Testament. The whole New Testament when it was first made. But we do know... That the epistles, Paul, James, Peter, and Jude, were probably the first. And then not too long after that, the Gospels, Luke, Matthew, you know. And, uh, and so what happened was when people found out that, hey, there's other books that are authoritative that have been, uh, that the church has been using for ages, uh, they compiled, compiled a, uh, you know, a formal list, um, why, do we make, why did they make a list? Again, why did they make a list? You could imagine, right, a church, the new age, you know, church is starting after Jesus' ministry, and why would they need to make a list? Right? Because uh, the events are happening as they, as they are going. Paul is writing letters, and, that, and what happened was that there are many heretics. And we see them today, too. Prosperity gospel. Um, one thing, there was many heretics, next slide. And the second reason was Romans uh, sought to destroy Christianity. So what they did was they burned or they destroyed the lit tried to destroy the literature. So there had to be some collection or the canon, the New Testament canon that would say, this is the, uh, these are the authoritative books of the New Testament. And in those, day, those days, the, all, you know, most of the Christians were already in agreement of what was authoritative, okay? So... The official, official list of the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament, give me five seconds, a little more than that, um, was published by Bishop of Alexandria, 328, okay, A.D. Uh, and uh, why did he do that? Because, again, there were people that, uh, that would preach that, uh, you know what, Don't forget the Old Testament. We have the New Testament, you know, listen to us. Oh, and, and Christ was not really... God and man, he was, you know, he's a great teacher. And we have our own writings, right? So there was a lot of heresy going on. There was a lot of heresy going on. So this bishop published the official list of the books. And again, he didn't make anything up. He didn't make anything new up. This, he published, he basically said, we all agree, these churches agree, that we have been using these books since the end of Christ's ministry. Let's just make an official list so that none of the heretical writings will be included in, in this um, canon. You know what I mean? So they closed it. Again, the, next slide, elements of canonicity. What, what did they require? I know that's a hard word. Next slide. Please, okay. Starbucks, anyone? Guys up there, are you guys awake? Thank you. What was, it, what was needed 
for the books, again, to be in the canon, and this is interesting, they have to have apostolic authority, right? Second thing is antiquity. The work had to be pr a product that dated to the apostol apostolic age. Third thing, uh, orthodoxy. So consistency with the doctrine. So you won't have anything new like, you know, oh, there's another God. No, it has to be consistent with the whole Bible, Old Testament and the apostles. And the last thing is it has to be accepted by the original churches and continued in use in public worship. So, so those four things that you were talking about. So every, in, in, there we go. So you're saying everything in the New Testament, uh, all, all, all four of those apply. Everything, yeah. All of, yeah. Those, all of those apply, again. And uh, there were many other writings that were not included in, in, in this canon because either they didn't have the authority, apostolic authority, or the orthodoxy. It didn't match with the Old Testament and the apostles. Well, can I jump in and ask you about a couple of specific ones here? Okay, shoot me. All right, shoot. <laughs> Uh, we're, I, we're friends, you know, no, like, uh, uh, but um, uh, let me ask you this specifically. You, you've watched the Da Vinci Code. I've, I've heard of it. I didn't have time to watch it. Okay, heard, so, and I, I haven't either, so, but uh, my Who watched the Da Vinci Code, by I the way? I watched like a trailer, so, okay, a couple. Okay. Mike did a job, and everyone, he watched it. Everybody, <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but uh, apparently, and correct me if I'm wrong, because all I saw was a trailer, but it's about Tom Hanks, and he's in this movie, and they find uh, the books about Mary Magdalene. Is that, am I right? Uh, who apparently wrote that she was married to Jesus, you know, and, and there's that whole, you know, gospel that she wrote about. Uh, or uh, recently, the discovered book of Judas, uh, which also writes some crazy things, which, again, I haven't read it, but my understanding is it talks, uh, it says some things that go against what we know. Uh, and he claims, that, you know, the, the claim is that Judas wrote it before he died, and, and he wrote some things that counteracts completely what some of the apostles said. Uh, and casts a bad light on Christ and some of the things that he did. So how do we know that things like that are not the truth, you know? When you're talking about stuff that came from that age and time and that we're finding and they seem to be pretty legit, um, how does that influence what, what you're telling me today? Okay. We're talking about not, thank you, good question. Yeah. We're, we're talking not just about a regular book. This is the truth, guys. We have the truth in our hands, the truth. And what happens with the truth? It gets attacked. And so you mentioned the Gospel of Magdalene and the Gospel of Judas. The Gospel of Judas was found in 1978. And what was written in it, um, it portrayed a different creation of the, uh, of the earth. And um, the Gospel of Judas, um, made a laugh out of, you know, the apostles' mistakes, you know, in, in their lives. So it was very critical. Uh, this, the, it wasn't the spirit of the Bible itself. It was a very critical writing. And so that, that's why it wasn't, it wasn't uh, included in the canon. I do have to mention this, though. The Gospel of Judas, the, the Gospel of Magdalene, Magdalene or Mary, Ma Mary, Mary Magdalene, Magdalene okay. correct. Um, it was a Gnostic work. Written around 180 A.D., for instance, uh, the Gospel of Magdalene specifically, and only fragments of it survived. So that does not give us everything. But it teaches, for instance, that Mary, this Gospel, teaches that she had a superior authority over men, over all, you know, Peter, other apostles. So she was like the head apostle over Yeah, everybody? right? So something's not clicking here. And so I, I dug deeper and said, what, what's happening here? Why aren't these books included? And I found out that actually, you know, back in their time, you would have people that, let's say, let's say I wanted to become popular, right? And I would say, well, they, they would make up, they would be anonymous writers that would make up a name, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. They would make up this name just to gain popularity, but then they would have a content that is way out of you know what the Bible says. And this is why they aren't included because first off, they are not old enough. Thank you, Oksana, for explaining us, right? That the, the, the original books were recent or to Jesus Christ's ministry. They weren't old enough, meaning people wrote it afterwards, tried to make a new, new uh, gospels. And they were not written by the apostles or eyewitnesses of Jesus. This is really important. That's why 
I do have to say this, that the canon that we have in our Bible, it's closed. You cannot add any, any, anything more. You cannot subtract from it. So if we find another book that seems to be pretty legit. Yeah. Yeah, again, you, you can't. You can't add anything to it. It's closed. It's been, the, from the beginning of the church age, these are the writings that have been used by the early church. And so anything after that um, was written by other people who were not, again, they were not apostles and the word they were not eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to um, let you know, everyone, um, we do have this really treasure, treasurous book that we have, and oftentimes you don't use it. Oftentimes we, we treat it as a regular book. It's an inspired word of God, and there has been countless, numerous, you know, effort to bring it to us to, in, in our language. So I just wanted to encourage everyone to, in myself, to use it, to use it, because this is, this is gold, this is truth, this is the truth. What, we have the parable, right, that said that the man found treasure in the field. What did he do? do? He sold everything, and he went back, bought that field, because there was treasure on it. So I just want to encourage every one of us to um, be in God's word. Okay, I think that's all the time we have today. Let's give Artem a big hand. Let's give all these folks a big hand. Let's uh, go grab a seat. Everything they said was true. You know, it's what I use on a daily basis when I think about, is the Bible true? Uh, and I read it, you know? Uh, and you're going to have that thought because Satan, he's a hunter. Oh, man. He and, and you know, Satan and his demons, a lot, you know, we, th we think Satan's hunting us. But Satan, he's an individual. He's hunting bigger game. But his demons are going to hunt you. And then when, when, right in the middle of when you're reading it or through your friends, he's going to come and he's going to sow that piece of doubt in your mind. And it's, you're going to be like, yeah, this book, I'm, I'm not sure about it. Folks, raise your hand now if you've been saved. I mean, is that, is that not enough evidence right there? All these people here that have been changed through this. I mean, have you guys been changed through Charlotte's Web? You know, anybody that's been saved through that? Uh, or the Star Wars, Star Wars series, yeah? I was like, oh, it was life-changing, you know? I just saw Superman. I mean, it's just, oh, I'm a new person. You know, it, no, it, that doesn't happen. Yeah, you've got people that go crazy about it, and, but it, it's not life-changing, you know? It doesn't make a person who was addicted uh, to perhaps alcohol or drugs or, or, or sexual desires to all of a sudden stand up and be free. You know what I mean? That's the power of Christ. That's the power of Jesus that we gain through this book. And that's the greatest testimony of all. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's just all stand and pray together. Father, I really appreciate this evening that you've given us these, uh, every person here that's made the effort to come and attend and learn a little bit more about the book that guides our lives, that guides our existence, God. We understand that it is the path and the light to our feet. If we continue diligently in, the, in, in what you've set before us, if we take, and as we read, we take every single word uh, seriously and, and apply it to our life, not only will our lives be changed, but we know and we believe in your promises and in your prophecies that we will see you personally. God, today you are invisible to us. Today uh, you seem so distant sometimes, uh, but, but we know there will be a day when we'll stand at your feet and just all worship you together, God, because we've listened to your word. We've listened to what you've told us here. And just bless us with the courage to stand up for the truth. Uh, bless us with the knowledge and the wisdom to understand. Um, and bless us with your spirit so that it may guide us uh, correctly. Uh, bless us all now as we depart. Uh, keep us safe in this week. Fill us with your spirit. Um, and help us really dig into this wonderful book that we've got. Amen.